We could start with we could start with uh, introductions. Oh yeah, that might be ideal. <laughs> okay, uh, so I can start. Yes. Um, I'm Katya. Hi. I'm currently in two B. I'm in my I'm doing electrical engineering here, and I'm currently on my school term, and uh, I'm kind of part of UC society. And uh, there's also Ryan, who's also helping me. Uh, we're both running the event. And so he can also say a few words to describe, uh, introduce himself. Yeah, so uh, I'm Ryan. I'm the VP, co-VP academic. Uh, Andy Run is the other one. Um, and uh, I guess I can say a few words about the ECE Society. So uh, the ECE Society is uh, supposed to foster a community uh, for all uh, ECE students and the EC department. Um, we do things like uh, advocacy, uh, events, um, furniture, and rooms. And yeah. Great. Do so you want to call on us like in order and then we'll say stuff? Yeah. Sure. Um, okay. Uh, Patrick, would you like to kind of introduce yourself and let us know? Like, is anything anything cool you'd like to let the student body know? <laughs> sure. Uh, I'm Patrick Lamb. So I've been at Waterloo since 2008. And at we can interpret at in a broad term in that I went on sabbatical after completing my term as SE director in at I, I arrived in New Zealand on January 1st, 2020. I was going to stay for five months. Um, and then you can kind of guess how the rest of that happens. And so as long as teaching is remote, I'm uh, going to be outside the country and teaching remote, including um, EC459 in winter term. Sounds good. Um, Dan, do you want to go next? Sure. So I'm Dan Davison. I've been a Waterloo for about 20 years. Um, I've been in ECE the whole time. I was the associate chair at one point. Uh, now I'm the associate dean undergrad in engineering, uh, but I'm still an ECE faculty member. I'm in the controls area. Uh, I've taught recently 481, which is a 4A elective digital control systems, and I'm slated to teach it next spring as well. And next term, I'm teaching the 4B class uh, multivariable control systems, uh, which is one of my favorite courses. So it's, it's going to be online, of course, so that's something brand new for me too, but I'm uh, getting ready. And um, yeah, anyhow, that's who I am. And thanks for organizing this. Thank you. And uh, Andrew, could you please let us know about yourself? <laughs> sure. So I was hired on in 2005 uh, with the SE program as assistant, um, yeah, associate director and then director. Took four years off and then got to be uh, associate chair for EC undergrad. Um, I, I uh, teach a real-time operating systems course to the Tron students very regularly, which is pretty fun and involves concurrent programming, stuff like that. Um, and I've taught 222 a million times, but not recently. And uh, nine years ago, uh, my family and I moved to a farm. So I have 11 sheep. Uh, Two pigs, and I'm not sure about the number of chickens. <laughs> count your chickens after they hatch? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Count them after the predators visit. <laughs> All right. Cool. Uh, okay, so I'm going to start off with a question from one of our um, live viewers, I guess. I'm like a streamer now. Um, so uh, uh, Dan asks, at higher terms in 3B, it appears that a lot of our uh, uh, the term is project-based. Is there like motivation for this or why have you done this? So it's what based? Uh, project-based. Yeah, project-based. So rather than like labs, is that what the the comparison is between uh, or labs? Or assignments and exams, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Like compared to assignments and exams. I can I can talk about my philosophy. Um, I really would like students to learn by doing stuff and that's behind co-op as well as ideally academic terms as well. And the best way to learn stuff is by doing projects at 
higher scope. So you have more room for creativity, more room for engineering design, and it's sort of more work intensive to grade and to set in some ways, but I think it's more rewarding to, to work on projects or at least more educational. It's definitely more educational, I think, and I hope it's more rewarding. But there can't be downsides, right? Uh, like some students don't function quite so well in an unstructured environment and they can flounder without lots of help. And this is, we've had lots of projects in 3B specifically, like going back decades, even though the curriculum has changed, it seems that's always a term with lots of projects. And some students put in so many hours into the projects, like they overdo it. And, and they report like almost burnout. Uh, but that's usually because they're really into it as well, right? Like the projects, as, as Patrick says, the Patrick, the, the, um, the exam projects definitely lead to the sorts of things you can't do in an exam setting. Three hour, two or two and a half hour exam, you can't do much. You can do a lot in a 20 or 30 hour project. So it's, it's kind of trade-offs. Not everyone, you know, flourishes in every environment. Uh, so we do try to have a good balance everywhere, you know, in all the programs. Now, same with like labs. I remember when I was a student, hands-on labs, they never worked for me, not once. Every lab was just a bummer and I always were rushed, never had time to think. I like the things where you had offline, lots of time to think, go very carefully through things, not just flying through a lab. But other students said without the lab, they would learn nothing. So it's different learning styles. I think also um, 3B has been changing regularly for about five years now. Um, the latest version of 3B, which hasn't actually run yet, it has, for the computer engineers, it has a computer architecture, which is definitely a project course where you, uh, you make a, <clears throat> a pipeline processor uh, from scratch. Uh, but the other courses I'm looking at, compilers, database systems, networks, uh, I think they're more assignment-based from what I know. Um, but the, the current 3B comp Fairly big assignments. <laughs> Is that the only question? I think Katia disappeared, so I'll ask the next one. Um, so from uh, someone has submitted a question in advance. So there seems to be a significant amount of ECE students who go on to work in the United States after graduation. Uh, although no official numbers are published, we can see the SYDE slash SE class profiles online slash on Reddit that show the amount of students leaving Canada. So with that in mind, I have a sort of three part question. Uh, so the first part is, do you believe that there is this brain drain effect in ECE. Uh, the, the second part is, if so, do you think it's a problem? And the third part is, if the answer to the second part is yes, what action could the university or professors or even the government take? Uh, uh, so it's, there's a footpath that goes from the top of the hill to, uh, to Rafidi Terrace, from Upland Road to Rafidi Terrace. Uh, Professor Lamb, we can hear you. Yeah, um, I'm just. Okay. You, you okay. asked the question? Sorry, that's so, a good oh, question. The... Yeah, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I was going to say this is a, a very long term issue, right? And very real, I would say. Uh, everyone is aware of the huge, I don't know if the word drain is right, but it's certainly a, a big net flow from Waterloo to Silicon Valley area. And it's been like that at least 25 years. Um, you asked many questions there. Can we, is it good or bad? It's mixed. Um, you know, for the individual students who go, it can be great. Um, they gain massive experience. It's good for the university to get all that exposure down there. Uh, a couple of years ago, they had a survey of Silicon Valley companies and they asked where they hired from. Uh, and Waterloo was number two. Like, I think Caltech was number one or something. Like, so we're, like, we have big exposure down there. The, I heard years ago, the, the hope was that as those connections were made, a lot of that would come back to Waterloo and Toronto area. 
and we'd have you know more networking and connections and and, and it would help us um, and i I'd, i can see some of that but i think overall still there's a strong net flow of everything going down there and so from a taxpayer point of view you might think what a waste like the ontario government is spending billions of dollars on universities in the area and to what purpose when you know many of the best students just leave uh, and so it's I, I can see from a taxpayer point of view you might think what a waste but from an education point of view universities have always been interested not in politics but in educating and so if the, we have amazing students who do amazing things get a great education and do great things down there it's still good from our point of view it's not you know we they have to stay here but so is that big history of bringing in students from all over and sending them everywhere. Uh, but personally, I think as myself though, like from the Ontario government point of view, could they not try to do something uh, to make it so, I don't know what, so startups are just so much cheaper to run here or something like that, I don't know. You, you can't stop people from going though, right? It's, it's you know, we're both free countries. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's been a, a touchy issue for many, many years. Um, and it's, I don't think, I haven't seen any big change. That's the thing. So it's not like they were predicting 20 years ago, it would help us immensely. Google and companies set up little satellite campuses here, but those are often, you know, sort of cynical, cynically, those are often so that they can take our best people, sort of, you know, try them out here and then send them down, uh, down to the States. So it's, uh, they're just not necessarily because they really want to have a massive presence here. So that, that's my perspective on it. Uh, I can see sort of multiple sides uh, and some good things and some bad things. Like like many of these complicated issues, it's not cut and dry. Anyhow, that's my perspective. I don't know if anyone else has input. Um, back when I was directing the software program, which would have similar issues, um, yeah, a large percentage were going down to the States, maybe 80% of grads. Um, but quite a few um, had plans to return at some point, maybe in five years was kind of the number that I heard. Um, and there, I mean, there has been an increase in software companies in the area in Toronto. Um, there was a, a page, pager duty. I think, is that what it's called? Can't remember. Anyway, um, they opened a pretty big office in Toronto, partly because the founders were from this area. So yeah, I'm hoping it's improving a bit, but yeah, it could just be a cynical, try somebody out and ship them south. Um, yeah. I actually have the, the um, graduation survey from this past winter in front of me. And it looks like it's definitely more of an issue for computer engineering than electrical. So for the electricals, the majority were expecting to be in Ontario, but outside the Waterloo region. So I'm going to guess that's mostly Toronto, maybe a bit in Ottawa. Um, some in the US, so like 28 plus 9 plus 2 would be Canada, uh, and then 17 in the States. Uh, whereas for the computer engineers, it was 94 in the US uh, versus 68 and 27 uh, and 11 in Canada. So roughly half and half. So it's not quite as bad, I think, with the comps for some reason as with the softies. I don't know why that is. Yeah, what's the student view of all this? Is it, because it's an interesting question because it's posed from the point of view that this might be a problem, whereas most students I think are happy with the possibility of going to work at, you know, Apple or Google or something. Um, I was in here for half of this because my internet cut out, but no, I feel right. like a lot of students really glorify the whole Cali experience. I do think that like a lot of people come into Waterloo, especially like first year. And like, I remember like, hearing people like in like 1A, like half of their applications were to California already. Like it's definitely like the biggest, I think, I don't know. I feel like some people just kind of want to have the experience or it's just kind of like an experience of like, oh, I'm doing well for myself. And since a lot of people strive for it. I feel like as a result, they kind of get return offers to go to the States or overall, maybe the States just might have more opportunities in the tech field. I know that 
not a lot of like jobs really are Toronto based or they'll be like a state's office and then they'll have like a divisional office in Toronto. That's usually what I've been hearing, but maybe I'm just, that's just my group of friends and such. I, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts on this question. I don't know which thoughts people <laughs> said, but I certainly ran salary surveys and the money is um, a lot better, I guess, even after you adjust for cost of living. Um, and so part of the thing is Canadian companies are not willing or able to pay the salaries that the U.S. companies are. And money isn't everything, but it's a, it's a big deal. And then there's certainly, as Kayla was saying, career advancement issues with like being in the U.S. where everything is as opposed to being in Canada. Um, having said that, I think there's a lot of remote work these days for pandemic reasons, and we'll see what happens after that. Um, there's another message in the chat, and I'm just we're gonna go off that next. Um, to the teachers, uh, the profs, uh, has there been any big upsides to teaching remotely, and um, due to what's happening in the world right now, beyond not required being in the country, <laughs> um, or has being asynchronous uh, made uh, getting feedback a lot more difficult and such? It's a very uh, loaded question, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. Who wants to go first? I can't. I haven't been teaching. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So you can go ahead, Dan, and then I'll follow sure. up. Okay. So I taught in winter and spring. Uh, so I was right in the, when the pandemic started. Um, it was a real shock at the beginning. And I would never have imagined teaching online. It was something if you asked me a year ago, I would have said I have no interest in online teaching. It's a lot better than I thought it would be. Um, there are definite advantages. Uh, students, for if, if things are done well, like this, it can be done very poorly like anything, right? And if the instructor just throws notes on the web and says, learn it yourself, well, that clearly is bad. That's like an instructor showing up to a lecture, dumping notes on the desk and walking out. Like that's, that's poor instruction. But if it's done well, students um, get a, I did all asynchronous everything. Everything they saw was highly polished compared to my usual stumbling around but I added pauses everywhere so that I wasn't just rushing through it. So students, so 45 minute lectures were boiled down to 30 minutes of lectures with 15 minutes of exercises and so on. And they were very good lectures. Like, like I, I, I spent about four or five hours in each half hour really getting to the essence of what I wanted to say. So it actually made me better as an instructor. So I really had to boil it down to what am I, what's the, the gut thing they have to learn here. And so I, th I thought the quality of instruction in my own classes was better because they really saw 30 minutes of amazing stuff instead of 45 minutes of stumbling around. Students reported they can, like I, I kept track of how many times people viewed things. Some of the lectures were watched three times by each student on average. So some of the harder material. So students can go back and look things that, especially with before tests, people go back and go through them. So that's something you can't do in an in-class session clearly. Also, students reported, because I asked them regularly how it was going, sessions that were easy, they would either speed up or even skip the lecture. And, and so they have much more flexibility in, in how that works. And, and so that's a real plus, I thought. And of course, if students can't attend lectures because of their illness, their sick or you know, whatever the issue is, uh, they, they can now set their own schedule. So I found it was quite positive from that point of view. Students did very well in the course as well. Um, but of course there's drawbacks too. Like there wasn't the same interaction that you can get in the classroom. So students did not see reactions from other students, which of course is a real plus. So if you're a bit confused and another student asks a question that may help you as well. And there's, other, there's ways to try to tackle that, but I think it, they're not as good as being in person. Uh, there's other drawbacks like the uh, online testing is not as good as in-person testing. And so the Professors have to try to either be clever, make trickier exams or randomize exams or things like that. Some students, you know, cheating went up. So there's problems with testing uh, in an online environment, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous. Uh, but there's other advantages too. In my class, I had students from other universities attend. You just wanted, wanted to get a few credits. So all that stuff, which you know, suddenly were opened up to the world. And so they're like, the instructor doesn't even have to be literally in the, in the country. So. I'd say overall, like everything, it was a mixed bag. 
Uh, and, and I think in the long run, we were talking about this at the faculty level, there's a very strong uh, idea that teaching is not going to go back to normal ever. This, this has opened up something which we would never have. Again, if you're, a year ago, you said we have a long-term plan where you know we're going to have lots of blended classes and, and half the class is going to be online. It would never have happened at Waterloo. It would have taken 50 years. Well, now it's happened in one year. And we're seeing there are some there's some pluses, and th we're there's been a, a very strong uh, desire to take advantage of the pluses of the online teaching, but also the advantages of the the in-person teaching. So the blended classes means, for example, some of the more easy standard lecture stuff. Watch that online. Come in for labs, for discussions, for sessions dealing with the harder material, uh, and so it, it could be a very different environment. You know, whenever the pandemic ends compared to before, hopefully better. And so there's, I, I see real pluses coming out of this. Some students, by the way, who don't, didn't do so well in an in-person environment because some students, they reported they were so shy, they would be always be a scared, to ask, scared to ask questions in, in class and things like that. In an online environment, they're much freer. You know, it's more anonymous. And so they're, they actually participated more in an online environment than they said they did in an in-person environment. And so for some students, they actually flourish in an online, but many students didn't. Many students reported they were not doing well in, in surveys. Uh, they, they just collapsed without having that classroom environment. So it's interesting that some students have gone up in, in their experience and some have gone down. And same with teaching. The online teaching, anyone who's taught online realizes it's a huge amount of work. It was, it's huge. I put in, as I said, four to five hours per lecture versus usually I put in two hours, one hour to prepare and one hour to teach for a class I've already taught 10 times. So it's, uh, it's very time consuming. Uh, and some students reported they took a lot of time to learn the same amount of material too. Uh, but maybe they learned it better. Marks went up last term uh, about 10% across the board. So it's, it's a very complicated picture. Good, excellent question though. Andrew. <clears throat> I think a lot of the same things. Uh, so I taught in the summer and I'm teaching the same course again in the fall. And a real plus for me is that I've been able to uh, reuse like 99% of my lecture videos. Thankfully, I didn't put any dates in them. <laughs> uh, my wife's actually doing a couple of courses right now. And I noticed they put, they say what day it is. And I just scratched my head at that. But anyway. Um, so for myself, I had always uh, worked either at the board or with a document camera. Um, and so when I had to transition online, I knew that PowerPoint had never been good for me. I get poor reviews uh, when I do try to use PowerPoint, just for whatever reason, I'm better off writing and talking. Uh, and so I explored a number of options and ended up trying to do kind of the Khan Academy style. So uh, writing on a tablet, colored pen on a back background and talking. Um, so the investment was really pretty reasonable. I just bought an eighth generation iPad for maybe 600 bucks. I uh, bought the uh, Apple Pencil for whatever, 120 maybe, and a microphone. Um, and yeah, microphones are important. I didn't get a super expensive one. Uh, this is mine here. It's a uh, uh, condenser microphone. So I think that means it's more directional. <laughs> I'm not an audiophile. Anyway, um, and <clears throat> what Dan said about the amount of work is true. So um, I estimated based, all my lectures are on YouTube as well as learn. And so I estimated, I didn't want to like add up all the times, but a rough estimate was there was 18 hours of material there for the term, so that's uh, half hour lectures because you normally have 36 lectures. Um, and the amount of work can easily be three hours of work to produce a half hour lecture um, or more. Um, there's getting the delivery right. Uh, sometimes you just mess it up and you just start over, but, but the editing also takes quite a while. Uh, and the planning too, you have to really think about what you're gonna say, it saves you on the editing side later. Um, and I actually had the strongest course review last term that I've ever had. So, oh, wow. <laughs> so it worked out. <laughs> um, yeah, so it is weird 
not interacting face to face with the students. Uh, I mean, the questions are nice, it's enjoyable interacting in a classroom, uh, but also you don't have any feedback. So you have no idea how it's going. So at the start of the term, it's like, man, this is pretty bad. Like, <laughs> but it ended up going okay that way. Um, testing has been interesting. So last term I did take home exams. So they started the first one, not exams, tests, four tests for the term. First one I gave them 36 hours, included some coding. Uh, and I bumped it up to 48 hours for the last three. Um, and they were harder than the tests I'd done before. Um, the marks were extremely high and I don't think it was cheating. Um, the, I was able to run MOS on their code submissions and only caught one student that was clearly cheating. Um, it's hard to say, but I had a ridiculous class average. I think it was 90 or 91%, which, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, which just got me asking, you know, like, what's the point? Are we trying to, you know, differentiate students? Or are we trying to make sure they learn? Probably trying to do both. Uh, this term I've gone to timed assessments. Um, which I think does address the, the cheating issue a bit more. Um, it's not perfect, but you know, if there's just enough time with a bit of a buffer so that they're not scrambling, um, it makes it that much harder to cheat, although not impossible. Uh, it's really important. I was talking to Sayed, he's uh, a fairly new EC prof. He was emphasizing like how important it is to make sure that um, we do everything we can to eliminate cheating because um, the majority of our students, we would assume are not cheating. And for them, it's really unfair if, you know, 10% of the class are getting together and doing their tests together and skewing the results. Yeah. Yeah, I just recorded a video today about uh, academic integrity for next term. Um, right. I think, one thing that maybe we haven't touched on is that part of the purpose of the university is part of the purpose of courses is teaching material, but it's also about um, getting to know people, getting to know how people think, including instructors and including your, your fellow students. And um, I think that's a lot harder to do when you're not in person with your peers as well. It, it came up a bit in terms of like Dan's response to like, people don't know how other people are responding to the lecture as well. And I think it's important to think about, people have thought about this before, but we've never really been forced to think about it in such a way. The, the value of sitting in class versus the value of other ways of learning and what we want students to actually gain from, from school. Um, I have a question about how the faculty is supporting the professors to transitioning to online. Like I. I don't know if there was like, because like, I know like transitioning for us was very difficult because like I really enjoyed the classroom setting and I, that's like my ideal atmosphere. But I mean, for the profs who've done like 10 years of teaching in person, like how does that, like how did, how did you transition? Like, I, I don't know, I just, I just find it really interesting myself. Um, there, was a, there was a lot of advice coming out uh, in the winter as we were flipping over and also into the spring. Uh, for engineering, actually, a lot of that advice flowed through Dan. Um, so he would communicate with the associate chairs like myself and then, uh, or directly to the instructors. And um, I don't know, Dan, do you wanna talk about? Yeah, well, it was a bit of a panic, especially in March, right? Like that was literally a couple of weeks. So just as the students were kind of panicking, you know, like, like just dumped in the deep end. That's how we felt too. Uh, so it's just not, you know, I, if this was done over the 50 year plan, it would have been, here's the, you know, the platform we're using, here's everything. And so it was very much, here's some good advice. Here's some stuff not to do. Choose a platform that works for you. Aim in some guidelines, like do things as simple as possible. You know, don't try to do something sophisticated, simple technology, simple, simple, simple to keep it things, you know, less things going wrong. Uh, but you can kind of see a result of that is every, every professor seems to have done something different. And students, of course, have rightly complained that I'm taking five courses and I have to learn eight platforms, you know? Um, well, it's the same with instructors. Like we were dumped in this, you know, so all of us had to learn Zoom, 
WebEx, Teams, you know, you go through like five different platforms just to hold meetings. So it's kind of like, all right, but now we're used to it. And actually, I think we've all come out more positive because I don't care anyone wants to talk to me now, I can handle it. And if we were just to use one technology, we would be more afraid and constrained. So it was, it was a real deep end experience for all of us. But now there's now that we're sort of more in this, uh, some best practices have, have emerged. And um, the, you know, for example, starting in the, well, ideally in the winter term, but it looks like it's gonna be spring. A lot of lecture rooms are being set up with really high-end technology. Uh, so for running blended courses, not just a camera, but more sophisticated things. And that's being run centrally so that not every professor or every department has to do its own thing. But that's kind of, again, long run. That's, that's just, we wanted to do it for winter, but so many different departments are requesting this kind of thing across campus. The people who install this thing said they're now booking for April. So it looks like spring is gonna be the time. Uh, so, and, and the university did set up something called the Keep Learning site, which students I think also have access to, which has a lot of tips, but it took them months to really get some good stable material up there. So I think it was very much do what you can, following these best practices, including things, keep things simple. A uh, big question at the beginning was, should things be synchronous or asynchronous? That was one thing that was debated hotly. And the university there decided asynchronous is better because students had just fled the campus. So they're all over the world. Some students might be sick or having to take care of family. So we don't, you know, maybe they can't work mornings or whatever. Uh, but engineering kind of said, well, you know what? We think some synchronous is gonna be really valuable for students. And we've been leading the pack in that direction. Other faculties are still sort of on the asynchronous mode, but their students are saying we need some synchronous. I think that all survey results have shown a mixture is ideal. No one wants synchronous 24 hours a day, but no one wants zero hours a day. It's nice to have some structure, but also some free time to you know, organize yourself. And, and I think engineering actually has hit overall, perhaps unintentionally, a, a pretty good mixture of synchronous versus asynchronous. I, mean, I do think that ECE historically had a lot too much synchronous. Uh, like, you know, you look at the number of hours in the first year schedule. Well, it's, it's, schedule. it's packed. And it's, yeah. like, it's like, there's too many hours here. This is not, this is not the right thing. Yeah. So that's okay. an example of something that could change in the long run, right? We're not going to come back in spring or next fall and say, okay, just throw away all that online stuff, all the hundreds of thousands of hours of work, just throw it away and go back to the old stuff. It's not going to happen. Uh, right now there's investments in technology and learning that, you know what, there are some advantages of not for teachers as well, not to have, you know, five hours a week of contact time or you look down to two and maybe do more stuff online or more small group things. And so I, I'm actually quite optimistic that overall the education experience will be better after the pandemic. This is a very unexpected um, change in the way teaching is happening. Um, one thing um, from my position that <laughs> has been difficult is um, managing a workload and trying to balance, like spread it out, but also keep it down. Um, and that's been a subject of discussion, I think, at the faculty level, but also at our department meeting last week. Um, the undergrad studies committee was proposing some rules for next term. Um, and um, one was that, you know, each course should have at most one um, deliverable per week and preferably less than 12 over the term, maybe eight. Um, and one thing that we're borrowing from civil and environmental engineering for next term is that we're going to negotiate a day of the week for each course for their deliverable. So the course only gets can only do one thing once per week at most. That should help balance it. It won't be perfect, but um, that seemed to be well received. Uh, another issue is that um, not, yeah, like Dan said, not all instructors have done the same thing. In fact, probably nobody's done exactly the same thing. But one division is that uh, a bunch of us have gone to more assessments, spread things out, keep people engaged with the side effect that students have said they're too busy. Um, others have kept a midterm and a final, which is tricky for academic integrity. But um, so an issue that we encountered this term is, you know, we had uh, 
two profs in one cohort having a midterm in the, the same week, which is fine. But what about the other five courses? They were still running lectures and um, could be having assignments. So we're going to look at that for next term. Um, and uh, courses, actually, we're going to be addressing this again next week at, at undergrad studies, but probably courses that run a midterm won't have any lectures in that week. Uh, and there won't be any labs at all that week. Courses that aren't doing the, the midterm exam combo that traditional way will still run lectures during the week, but not have any big assignments. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we're trying to do. Another thing is telling instructors over and over again to limit the amount, like they've got 10 hours of a student's time per week, including watching their lectures once, twice, three times, um, and work and uh, stuff like that. And uh, a thing that came up at the last faculty operations meeting was uh, is suggesting giving estimates of the work required for an assignment or whatever, and then getting feedback from the students to see how close you are. And that might help us. So. so we all care a lot about workload, especially I guess the ones of us who are here. Um, I want to mention that uh, this morning um, or this afternoon for you, the, the Dean Mary Wells had a town hall and she mentioned that she had she had been at Waterloo before and then she was Dean at Guelph for a few years and came back to Waterloo. And she mentioned the fourth year students at Guelph were so excited and um, energetic and the students at Waterloo just seemed kind of beaten down. Yeah. And I think we would like to try to avoid that as much as possible. It's, it's a tough question. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so the next question we have is, uh, Historically, a lot of programming-based courses typically focus on classical programming as opposed to modern concepts in ECE. Has there ever been faculty interest in offering courses on more modern programming, i.e. modern C++, contemporary OS development, etc.? I'm too far from the software area to even know the trends, but to comment, I don't know. I, I know there's a lot of conversation about what's being taught in terms of programming languages is always being discussed endlessly, it seems. But can you guys, Andrew or Patrick, explain why? <laughs> I is think there... that C++, C++ is not an, un, like it's a good choice, I think, for computer engineers. Uh, a lot of systems programming is done in C++. Uh, um, it would be good to be exposed to some other concepts like functional programming, which that's in C++ now, right, Patrick? It is to, in C++, well, but it's not the dominant paradigm. C++. Right. We can do it. Um, yeah, no, I know Patrick's course next term, um, they're talking about using Rust. Is that going to be are, primary? Yeah, we, have, we are doing the switch. So we've done all the materials in Rust. Um, so yeah, we, ha we are using a very modern language in ECE 459 for sure. There's no, there's no course in the ECE curriculum that really talks about C++ in general, really. Like there's a course in the SE curriculum, CS 247, which has a fairly deep view of um, C++, but that is not the focus of computer engineering or, or electrical engineering. Now we could do the, uh, the CS thing and teach you scheme in uh, first year, but <laughs> That may not work out so well for your co-ops. I'm curious what languages people would suggest. I mean, there's stuff like Haskell and Go. And... I would maybe address the contemporary OS development thing and saying, um, or maybe in general, it's like universities in general are supposed to be about fundamental techniques, right? And so the things you learn in ECE 350 are fundamental techniques and um, the specific language you use doesn't matter so much. And, you know, that was kind of the case we felt for 459 as well, with C++ versus Rust, but we decided to go to Rust because it's good to have another point of view on things. Okay, I'm going to uh, read the question for one of our live uh, viewers. Uh, will the presence of newly created online learning materials affect future semesters? For example, once classes return to being in person, 
do instructors plan to provide the pre-recorded lecture videos as an additional resource for students who may have permit may have missed the lecture? <laughs> I think Dan kind of alluded to that a bit, like or maybe it's Patrick reducing contact hours. Like, do we really need uh, the three hours of lecture and uh, the and uh, tutorial and such like? Uh, there's been a couple profs that have already been working with the flipped classroom paradigm, uh, Dave Wong and George Freeman. Uh, I was always too weirded out by it to think about trying it. Uh, but now that I've done the online lecturing thing, I'm kind of wondering, like, I, I don't know the answer yet, but I'm more open to something where I, I definitely do not plan to take my lectures down once, you know, we're back on campus. Why would you? Yeah. Um, huge effort to prepare them, right? <laughs> yeah. So I'm kind of leaning more towards maybe more problem solving in class, that kind of stuff. But I don't know, no problems this yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've always had my lecture notes available for students. Like they, I don't copyright them and so on. They can do what they want with them. Same with the videos. So I have no reason to take them down. They're all on YouTube and <laughs> And why not have a link to the, the most relevant lectures? One problem with lectures is that online those become obsolete eventually, right? And right. I've, I've already had to go back over a couple of lectures from the spring and, and do corrections. It is very painful doing a correction in a, 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 a video. Like it's outrageous how much time and effort's required if you wanna make it fit in. It's far easier just to redo it. Like it's, and so this sounds great for the next few years, but what do you do four or five, certainly 10 years from now when everything needs refreshing, uh, then I, I don't know. So do that, that's, that's what we'll have to discuss. You know, is this gonna be a long-term, yeah, which means you have to keep videos up to date, in which case, you know, there's a model where you just update like 10 or 20% of them per year. Updating all of them per year is forget it, that's too much work. Uh, but, you know, 10% or maybe just, you know, strategically do parts. Uh, George, he's, he did the, first year uh, biomedical engineering software course and he's had it flipped from the beginning it's gone extremely well uh, but Dave Wong's experience was more mixed so he had a fourth year elective and the when students found out it was this flipped model it was an elective so students could drop out a bunch of them dropped right away they clearly did not want to be there so it's not for everyone it, it, it required very it basically said if you didn't if you don't do the independent work watching the videos beforehand and learning don't come to class like you're not going to learn because i'm assuming you've gone through that in the class where then building on that reinforcing it doing it, pr practical exercises based on that and if you don't know the material at all forget it you're going to just mess up the rest of the class so it it put more responsibility on the students which you might say is very good but some students didn't like that and so I don't. I, I can't imagine us doing a wholesale flipped uh, switch where everything is flipped, like everything's using old videos and so on. Because some some students will not. They'll just flounder in that, and, and it's going to be perhaps dependent on the material and the instructor. And I, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. But I know it won't be all just going back to the old lecture style. That's just not going to happen. That's. Uh, I again. I I was convinced I would never do online. Never. And now I'm actually. I like it. Uh, but I can see if I also had a live tutorial per week, that might be ideal for me. Watch the lectures. The lectures are all, I put huge effort to make them really good. Like they're interactive. You, you know, I say pause here and there's, you know, there's music and stuff just so they could go through the notes, fill, do these exercises. But then we come in and we go through harder exercises or, or maybe, you know, if, if video was unclear and something, I can clarify a, a bit of it. And so I can picture that being a, really the best of both worlds. Uh, but that's just me for my one class. Uh, it, it's, it, it could be each class is a bit different. <laughs> you know, there's going to be no standard class from now on. Uh, it, it'll be interesting to see how we even do scheduling. You know, will we schedule everything synchronous and then profs don't have to use certain times? Or it'll be some courses are just scheduled now for one hour per week live and the rest is online. We haven't talked about you can just can just deal with it. Um, oh, yeah. I will, um, is another factor, yeah. I, I think there is this big stick now, and so that'll be hopefully useful for getting CAB to, to do some some motion. Um, another piece of context is that so I, I did grad school at MIT, and while I was there, uh, some physics education profs were like, "Lectures are stupid, right? They're not active. People just sit there. Whatever. It's not it's not inefficient." way of learning, right? 
And so they introduced this thing called TL, Technology Enhanced Active Learning. And so for first year, for freshman physics, basically EC 105 and 106, uh, instead of having traditional lectures, they would have these studios and you would go and solve problems with TA and prop help. And students hated that at that time because they were used to lectures and they were like, we actually like sitting like lumps for you know three hours a week and getting lectured at, uh, even though it's ineffective um, educationally. Um, so there was a lot of pushback to it at the time. Now that we've all had, everyone except for me has had online education, um, people will have different prior experiences with online learning. And so it'll be interesting times. The other thing about lectures, right, is like in my fourth year class, you know, a lot of people didn't come. So that was the fact. So a lot of, that's an excellent question that, um, that Martin asked. And I think no one knows the answer, but it'll be interesting to watch. Um, I do have another question from uh, someone who wasn't able to make it today, but do profs actually read like the Reddit pages? Because I know EC posts a lot on Reddit. And so people just were curious if profs like read any of it or they saw like, I don't know, everybody just wonders. <laughs> Some do religiously because I regularly get people, profs or, or even staff sending me, oh, look what's in Reddit today. So I think it's like their daily newspaper. <laughs> Other people, I only look if someone tells me go and look something up. Uh, I kind of just figure I don't have time to do that. But that's, yeah. <laughs> How about you guys? Personally, I don't. Patrick? Weeks to months, like every once in a while, I look at are you Waterloo? But not that often. Sometimes I reply to things. Um, we are approaching eight o'clock. And so uh, if any of you have any like other commitments, I just wanted to kind of give like a little heads up, but um, otherwise we can kind of continue and we have other topics we can discuss or. Sure, okay, yeah, I, I do need to vanish. Okay, I have to go at eight. I got my kids waiting for my our usual evening reading. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, I well, have a... um, <laughs> um, I guess we can end off with um, students like uh, me and Ryan who are like kind of in the middle of our education here in Waterloo for undergrad. What are like um, technical electives and upper year courses? Like a lot of people kind of want to know what we should be when we get any and, and like when we get to like um, where we can find like resources for them. Because it feels like you never kind of get technical electives or electives. Like only this term we managed to get, and that's because I think one of our prototyping courses had to be pushed back due to um, the pandemic. Right. Also, also any suggestions on technical electives? Yeah, or like any cool ones or that you might recommend. We are all open. <laughs> we like your input. How about 488 and 459? <laughs> courses, yeah. That's their courses. <laughs> Uh, and Andrew, do we still have that website which has all the fourth year courses, like the electives and a little like recent course outlines for them? It used to be something. Yeah, it's tricky to find. Uh, I'm still kind of learning my way around our website. Uh, I'll see if I can find it quickly right now. You can always reach out to professors. Like I'm teaching 48 next term and I've had probably 10 students from different programs reach out to me. I love that. I can tell them about the course, especially if they're wondering if their background is good or if they think this will fit their career, or maybe they're saying, this course looks interesting, but so does the other one. I can only fit one in and I'll, you know, talk about the relative advantages. Like that's, that's great rather than just randomly choosing courses or something like that. So mm -hmm. we can reach out to professors. There's an out of date um, webpage which says current as of spring 2017, if you search for technical electives. Um, 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 I mean, I could push, I could like advertise mine, but like, it's like, you know, huge. And so you'll probably find out about it anyway. Um, so some that, well, so an interesting one for the electricals is uh, the high voltage lab. So you actually, well, you actually get the opportunity to go into this lab where they test high voltage insulation and stuff like that and that's done in very small groups so i mean that sounds kind of cool the lab burned down about 10 or 15 years ago and they had to rebuild it it was a really long process 
Um, I would say that, um, let's see. Oh, there's um, Christoph's new course, Autonomous Vehicles. Oh yeah, that's very popular. Yeah. And uh, Wojtek uh, Golab teaches um, EC454 distributed systems, which is quite useful for people going into the software uh, industry afterwards. Hmm. I mean, the SE students who have a choice between the CS version and EC version often prefer the EC version of that course, in fact. Hmm. And um, we're, we're adding courses that are AI related. So we've always had um, two AI-ish courses. They, they both start with 457. There's 457 A and B. And we just recently added a 457 C, which is reinforcement learning. Um, 457B is about like deep neural networks, convol like convolutional neural networks, stuff like that. I know, I know the, um, what do you call them? The keywords, but not much more than that. Um, so, and um, there's an interesting course that's going to be offered this coming winter for the first time uh, by Kirsten Doudenham. I think that's how you say her name. Um, fairly new prof. She does social robotics kind of work. Um, so human interactions with robots. So there's going to be a technical elective on that, uh, which sounds pretty, pretty interesting. Um, yeah. One of the strengths of ECE is we do put a lot of resources into the fourth year elective. So that's where we really, that's where you see them all. Um, and when I was a student, I look back, I went to Toronto, great university as well. But there it was just more standard stuff. And, you know, you chose five out of 10 or something. Here you choose, I, I forgot the number, five or six electives out of like 30 or something. Uh, and some, many of them take you further than you go than you'd expect in an undergrad education. Uh, so for example, the, um, the high voltage lab that, that Andrew had mentioned earlier, like that's typically done in graduate school. Like being able to work in that environment is great. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, you can't actually do a lab there, but they are giving at least tours of the equipment in small groups. And you'll learn the theory of, of high voltage engineering. Uh, the control course I have is actually modeled after a first year graduate course I took at University of Michigan. Uh, I removed some of the math to make it simpler, but all the ideas are there. So students come out and students then go either work at companies where they do control or graduate school. And I get feedback, you know, every couple of years saying, wow, you guys at Waterloo really like the students come out really like advanced, not just, you know, being slightly exposed to things. And, and I think that's true in a lot of the courses, like people take pride in really you know, giving students the latest in, in the various areas. You can't go okay. wrong with, almost with any random five assortment. Like you're gonna get good courses in fourth year. Do you know about the robotics course, Dan, 486? Well, 486, yeah, so that's a, that's a more traditional robotics course. So a lot of focus on modeling robots, uh, a bit of control, but it's mostly modeling and they apply it to a uh, humanoid robot in a lab. I, don't think the lab is running though because of the pandemic but that's that's the environment you use so a lot of uh, algebra and a bit of calculus uh, yeah there's all these conventions for how you you know can you just imagine if you have to describe even a two link robot arm like you're very quickly getting into sines and cosines everywhere you just get tangled up so this, this it takes a while to develop all these standard conventions uh so that you can talk about and you know an arbitrarily complicated uh rigid robot and how to model it and um and all the dynamics and the kinematics behind it, and then the, a bit of control at the end as well. That always had a fun lab. Uh, and so it's unfortunate, a huge problem with the pandemic, of course, is no labs. Most, like that's one, that's one of the huge drawbacks, which we are aware of, of course, but, uh, and that applies to fourth year courses too, unfortunately. Another course I think that's kind of interesting, maybe it's my leaning, is uh, 455, it's embedded software. Um, I think it was developed by Sebastian Fischmeister, who's yeah. got one or two startups in the area. Uh, does a lot of a lot of research, and it's been taught recently by Carlos Moreno, who is a postdoc working with him. Uh, Rodolfo Pelizzone does real-time embedded systems. He's teaching it, so pretty strong teaching team, anyway. If that's your kind of thing. All right, uh, I guess that concludes the AMA. I just wanted to say thank you again for everybody, um, students included, for uh, attending and 
Um, it was really a fun time talking to um, well, all of you. I have never met Dan or Patrick before, but you guys are really great. And I'm kind of right. really leaning towards taking your love for your courses. So definitely persuade me. Um, yeah. So thank you so much. And right. um, I don't know, I'll have Ryan say the last words on behalf of UC SOC. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, thank you for attending. Thank you for participating. Um, I hope we can do uh, this event again, perhaps next term, uh, perhaps with different professors, or if you want, you can come back as well. Yeah, I, I think it's a great idea. I'd like to see it continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was a great chat. Thank you. Thank you for organizing this. And it's nice to meet you both and uh, all the participants out there. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Good. Thanks, Dad. Yeah. yeah, thanks for organizing this and for inviting me. Bye, bye. Bye, everybody. Stay safe. Have a nice uh, rest of the week. Bye. Bye.